stay hungry, stay foolish. Today's guest is previously best known for his position as head coach of the English national rugby team from 2011 until 2015. In 2016, he joined the backroom team of Ireland provincial side Leinster Rugby and has been instrumental in their current success. I've asked our guest onto the show to discuss leadership lessons from sport to focus on a business context. In this episode, we will talk about creating a why, a vision, values and behaviours to achieve success. We will discuss the benefit of failure and the necessity of resilience. We will discuss the desired characteristics for organizational achievement, and we'll explore the individual characteristics needed to achieve in any field. Stuart Lancaster, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. I thought before we launch into the leadership lessons, we might discuss your own upbringing. What I've found talking to so many entrepreneurs and business leaders is their background has had a dramatic impact on their mindset and what we become. Definitely. I mean, my background is I was brought up on a 360-acre farm in the very north of England, near enough to the border of Scotland, actually. It was a fantastic upbringing, really. It was a dairy farm. My dad worked the farm. I had an older brother, two years older, sister, three years younger, and then a younger brother who was uh, some 10 years younger than, than me. I went away to a small independent school, a boarding school, when I was 10 years old and stayed there till I was 18. And then from there... I went to university, did a sports science degree, PGCE, and then that led to eight years into uh, teaching the 11 to 16 comprehensive school in Wakefield. And then through a series of events, I ended up in full-time rugby as a coach, as academy coach initially, a coach in the premiership. And then I got the opportunity to coach the England national team. And here I am in Leinster, 49 years old now, still a long way to go, hopefully. Been a roller coaster ride, but more upset. One of the reasons I asked you, Stuart, about the child up- upbringing is stuff like work ethic, because working on a farm, you obviously got tasks to do, and they were just part of your upbringing. While in our world today, we're very, very soft on children in a lot of cases, and there's a lot of lawnmower parents or helicopter parents who smooth the way in front of their children, and they're not really doing them any favors by doing that. It was the work ethic of my dad, I think, initially as well. You know, when you're on a dairy farm, the, the cows need milking twice a day. He's up at six o'clock in the morning, he comes in at six o'clock at night, and you see how hard he's working. But also, you know, you're outside in the fresh air all the time, and I never saw it as work. I don't think my dad ever did, really. Um, so it's been a very rewarding childhood, really. And it definitely gave me a lot of the qualities I've got now. I think also going away to independent school. It's a good thing for me because it created independence and I had to sort of survive on my own rather than be, you know, as you say, my hand held by my parents. It creates character as well because I often thought this about, say, the New Zealand rugby team, that so many of the backgrounds of those players is farming, is tough upbringing where they have such an attitude of gratitude when they come into sports or they get to play for the All Blacks that it's such a privilege for them that they're not going to let it go easily. There's definitely that. And when you've had to work your way up to a national job, for example, you know, I know how many hours and how many days, and weeks and months I put into studying, coaching, leadership to get better at what I was doing because I wasn't, I wasn't a top end player. I didn't have that in, in my back pocket. You know, I had to basically work to get myself from this small farm to, to be a national coach. It was um, very rewarding to, to achieve that, but also a great reflection on my parents, really. And I think in Ireland, you know, I now work in Ireland, there's a lot of similarities as well between the environment I was brought up in and a lot of the way in which the, the Irish are brought up. There's a lot of farmers over here as well. And I think it's no coincidence that, you know, Ireland and New Zealand are number one, number two in the world at the moment. Upbringing is really, really important. And one of the reasons I bring this up is there's many, many parents who would like their children to be great sports people. But what they often do is focus on developing skills while instead of focusing on skills, they might instead focus on developing character. I was very lucky, again, in that my parents weren't the, the pushy parent type. They enjoyed sport, but they didn't live their lives through me. And I see it time and time again as a coach now, you know, where parents are living their lives through the kids. And as you say, trying to help them all the way through. We're actually often leading them to their own devices and letting them sink or swim or survive or thrive the way to go. My parents were, were there to support me to get me to the 
training sessions and drive me around everywhere, but they were never the ones who were you know, hanging on to my potential career, which was actually to my benefit, no doubt. When you were coaching in your early days before you became a professional coach, you would have spotted characteristics in players that you would have went, you know what, that's going to count for that guy in the future. What kind of characteristics did you spot in players? Well, I think it worked both ways. What counts for that guy in the future and also that's going to count against that guy in the future. It was a tough school, so there was a real mixture of kids from very affluent backgrounds to ones who were from very underprivileged backgrounds. And but the ones who succeeded, whether it be you know achieving county standard or regional standard as sports people or or for those who've achieved in getting out of the environment that they're in, in a tough, tough upbringing, success often for them was just to get to college or to go and get a job and get out of the, the cycle that they were in within their community. And the qualities really ranged from anything to do with resilience, mental toughness, work ethic, drive, determination, intrinsic motivation, good communicators, leaders, that desire to They'd never give up or never never give up at the first hurdle. They were the ones who really you could spot and think, this kid here has got a chance of being successful in life. And I saw that my job as a teacher, I saw, was to do that. It wasn't just to create elite sports people. It was to create people who were successful in life. That's why teaching is such a rewarding profession. That's why I love teaching because you could do that and you can make a difference. You know, it's a real formative years of, you know, between sort of 11 and 18 where you can shape personalities and help make a difference to people's lives. And I really found that rewarding. So teaching is actually coaching in another guise. You're coaching players for life, like you say. You're bringing them through life. You said something there about the upbringing and also the parental influence on people. One of the things I spotted in my own professional career was you have a schoolboy hero, an unbelievably talented player. And it was almost like in his early formative years, that bar was too low. And because the bar was too low, they never experienced any kind of resilience or resistance. And then they could become professionals based on their talent. But when they get into the professional setup, they suddenly encounter professionalism where players have those traits you talked about, resilience, character, never giving up. And they're in a totally different environment and they often fail. Well, often it's the first time they have failed and that's where they struggle. So there's a great article I read about the Rocky Road how the elite, the super elite, are ultimately the ones who've gone through the rocky road. So it's never been smooth sailing all the way. You know what I mean? There's always been ups and downs and non-selection or injury or something that's happened in their private lives or something's happened to a parent. Or And all these hurdles actually shape the mindset of the athlete to become that resilient, mentally tough driven competitor that ultimately goes on to win at the highest level and often i found that there were certain players who were always the best in the school who became best in the county who became best in the province who became best in the country they never achieved failure until they came you know in the open age bracket and suddenly they didn't get picked and they didn't know how to deal with it you know my own son if i take give you an example my own son he's 17 now he's quite a talented player he's been picked in some teams he's been dropped in other teams he's not been selected in other teams and I don't see these as hindrances to his career. I actually think they're going to help him because, you know, it'll force him to, to work harder to, to achieve what he wants to achieve. I love this concept. If we can instill that mindset into up and coming, not just players, because this show is a lot of CC executives, CEOs listen to the show and experience that failure and see it as a sign that, oh, this isn't for me. This isn't the pathway I should take. When that's not actually true, often we get these challenges and they're an obstacle to overcome. And by overcoming them, we appreciate what we get even more. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've I've had it in my own coaching career and more so than my teaching career, but my, my, my coaching career where every game, every week, you have a chance of experiencing failure. And, um, you know, if you're coaching a talented team, you win more than you lose, but you always lose at some point. And then you've got to pick yourself up as the coach and understand what went wrong, take the lessons from it, learn what to do next time. And you've got to do that by Sunday evening because Monday morning the players are coming in and they want to know the reason why we lost and what we can do better next time and how we're going to improve. And and so, you know, you go through this cycle of planning to do something, you do it, and then you either win or you lose in sport and then you review it. It's a real 
process in developing your own resilience and your mentality not to give up when things don't go your way. And I, and I obviously, you know, had the ultimate with this when I was coaching the England national team and, you know, we lost a game that, you know, nine times out of 10 we would have won and it cost me my role, cost me my job. And it cost, you know, a lot, a lot of heartache for my family and friends and, and everyone that came with me. And uh, the easy thing to do at that point would not, not, not have been to, to coach again. Uh, just didn't just stay hidden, hidden away and go back into teaching. That's not what drives me. I wanted to be the best I can be. I wanted to make a difference to other people. I wanted to help build teams. That's why I've come back to Leinster. And you went away after that period. I thought it was brilliant what you did. You went away to other countries. You went and you learned from other countries. You went to New Zealand. You went to the States. You helped with other teams. You didn't stop and you didn't go into a mourning period. While it hurts, of course it hurts. But you went and you actually took the best bits of what you had and you built on them. Yeah, I mean, I was determined not to let it break me. <laughs> there was, a, there was a, an inner determination and I wanted to come back into the sport that I coach in, you know, a stronger, a better coach. But there was a period of, as you say, in between jobs and a period of self-reflection and looking into myself. My way of dealing with that was to take myself away on my own. My wife's probably would have been slightly different. She'd have wanted to talk it through, but I just wanted to think it through. And I wanted to go and speak to other coaches and go and visit other organizations where I knew they'd been through a similar thing to give me that reassurance that, you know, there is a way back. And uh, people I met, you know, I'd say it was New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, America, people I met were fantastic, really and really helped me come to terms with losing my job as, as a national coach. And I never had any doubt over my belief in my ability to come back, but it was a critical period. And I think I made the right decision to, to get away, reflect and come back stronger or better. Even by being a coach, it's like being a leader of a company. You can put certain principles and visions and behaviors into place, but you ultimately can't control what others do. You can influence what they do, but you can't control it. So what I love what you did was you went away and you, you talked to other mentors and other leaders in their fields and you took the best parts of your experience and you built on them. And I mentioned this quote to you before the show, the phoenix must first burn to emerge. And the idea of the phoenix is it takes the best parts of the previous incarnation and builds a better thing. What were the lessons you picked up from going and meeting these mentors and other coaches across the globe? The main thing was that failure only defines you if you let it. You can sit there and think the events that happened in that game, you know, were out of my control and, you know, brush them off. But ultimately, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be as self-critical as I could be without it being destructive and then take those lessons and, and come back a better, a better coach. Um, another, another really interesting uh, quote was given to me by a, uh, an experienced coach. And he said, next place you go, Stuart, make sure you 100% want to go there and they 100% want you to come. And that served me well, particularly in coming to this role at Leinster. There were various other roles that came up in between time, but it either didn't feel right from my point of view, from either a family or a coaching perspective, but equally, it probably didn't feel right from their point of view either. So that was great advice. But yeah, I would say the failure only defines you if you let it, I think was probably the key thing that stuck with me. and. Um, I was never going to let you find me. I find that's a very, from speaking to people on the show and the main audience of the show is, is in the U S is it's very much a mindset over there that failure is just part of the process. You get that feeling from talking to entrepreneurs and innovators while more in, in Europe, it's almost like people define you like, like you say, by the success and failure. But I, I really do think sport is a brilliant preparatory stage for life, for business life, because you, you fail quite often and you're not picked you're publicly criticized in the papers etc or the public shouting at you from the sideline yeah. and it's a great way to actually build resilience players get scored on a scale on a, on a score a score of one to ten on every game can you imagine that if that was your your work or your business uh where yeah where every, every day you get you know you get scored on your performance and uh Players and coaches, you know, you, you tread a very small tightrope when you're walking along the margins of defeat and victory. The mentality I had was that, you know, I just want to get better now. I want to improve. I want to keep keep going by a, a better coach. And you're right, you know, sport is a great tool for teaching that that ability and those attributes. And there's a great book I've just read called Gridiron Genius, actually. It's an American book. And it talks about the second chance coach. How often the great American football coaches are the ones who've been given the second chance. In fact, the greatest American football coach. 
the ones who'd be given the second chance. You're right, in Europe, I would say some coaches, if you fail on your first chance, you often don't get a second chance. I loved what you did as well. Like, and, and I wanted to ask you about this because I was really attracted to this element of your career development was your own self-interest in self-development. So you went off to Ashridge College, you studied leadership, and you brought those principles, which are mainly business principles, Ashridge being a business college in the UK, yeah. bringing those principles and applying them to sports. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so, so my sort of leadership development, so I, I you know, was teaching between the ages of 22 and 30, and instinctively I was learning to lead. I was practicing it on a daily basis by teaching the kids, you know, at the school. Uh, I was gravitating up the the school system in terms of assistant head of department, deputy head of year, head of year, uh, to get more leadership responsibility. Then I went on a coaching course as part of the RFU development, um, and it was a level five, and it was more about leadership and management. Um, and it gave me a lot of the theory behind the practice I was doing. It opened my eyes to lots of literature and books. And we talk about, you know, learning from your own experiences. I've learned a lot from from the books I've read, from the leaders I've read about, from the coaches I've read about, you know, things like emotional intelligence and self-awareness and practical ways to get feedback on my own ability, books and podcasts, you know, you name it, I've probably read them all. And so I went through this period of from the age of, say, 30 to 40. And still now, to be honest, you know, every day I'll be looking to do something proactive to try and develop myself as a coach and as a leader. I would recommend it to anyone because now at 49, I feel I've got a good grasp of what it is and what I am and who I am. But equally, I still feel I've got a long way to go as well. That hunger for knowledge and, and for self-development in the current setup in sport, I see it currently with the Irish team, which are doing extremely well on your own team, Leinster, that there's no complacency, like success can lead to complacency, but there's no complacency, there's no room for it. So it's not a case of I'm there now, I'm at the destination. There is no destination. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly raising the bar incrementally every day. And it's something that you see with your career as well that you've brought. How do you impart then that to your team? I'm using the word team here in you as the role, as the leader, as the influencer, as the CEO, how do you then impart that influence onto the team? The Lens Ruby team is an example. They've been made up of 19-year-olds uh, to 33, 34-year-olds. And the easy thing to do as a coach is just to develop them as players. You know, I'm coaching them rugby and they're listening and learning the techniques and skills of rugby. But I see my role way beyond that. I see my role as a leader in developing them as people and developing their leadership abilities and raising their self-awareness and getting them to understand what good leadership looks like and how they can all become better leaders. And because when they finish playing, I want them to go and be successful in life. So I invest personally a lot of time in those relationships and using all the experiences that I've learned from the age of 20 when I was a teacher training college through to the age I am now to accelerate their development, to give them a better chance and be ahead of the game when I was at the same age. So when I think back to when I was 25 years old, you know, I was probably three or four years out of university. I was just enjoying teaching. I wasn't really thinking too much about leadership. Whereas a 25-year-old in the Leinster team, they're an experienced player. They, they need to be leading and dealing with the press and the pressure and inspiring the, the teammates and having a point of view on the game plan. And a lot of them, particularly in Ireland, actually, they're quite intro introverted. So they're happy to sit in the meetings and let someone else do it for them. And I'm forever pushing them out of that comfort zone. I'm getting them to do psychometric profiles, to do insights profiles, and to see what type of personality they are, to make sure that they have a point of view that they can make performance meaningful for the for their teammates and to ultimately lead in an inspiring way. And I keep saying to them, you know, I wish someone had done the same to me at the age you are now. You're five years ahead of where I was. So, and once they grasp that and they, they really begin to understand it, then you open their eyes and then suddenly they're accelerating through the door as I did as a 32-year-old, but they're 22. Yeah, I love this, man. This is a piece I've heard you talk about in your leadership talks, etc. is... This is what I see. Kids coming out of college, they don't know what to do. They're left to their own devices or somebody advises them on doing something and they go into a career and all of a sudden they're 40 and they're unhappy in their career. They have a fear of failure. Firstly, they have a fear of being judged by others by going and starting again. Like, like I said about the Phoenix, like you going and learning from what the experience was and then going and building on that. And they're stuck in a career and then they're, all of a sudden they're 50 and then it's too late. And they feel it's too late. And if you rewind back to what you did with these players and you go, 
in college. Imagine you were psychometric tested in college yeah. to show what you, what type of character you are, what you're like. We don't have enough time to go and try every different career before we go and choose on one. But if we had an idea, the difference that could make. I would go further. I, I, would, I would go down and I would teach leadership in school. I would teach emotional intelligence and get them to understand in school before they leave and go to college and try and get them to be more self-aware and understand their own personality and their own strengths and weaknesses and how they can develop them and what type of career they're going to be suited to. You know, we, we tend to teach, certainly in the UK, very academic subjects, you know, which are, could be chemistry or geography or it could be English or French or maths or whatever it is. And I think there's a whole host of things that we could do better to prepare people for, for life because it's not the people with the highest grades often that are successful in life. It's the people who can build relationships. It's the people who can inspire people. It's the people who can flex their leadership style to get the best out of everyone. These are qualities that I probably learned as I was going along, but you know, how useful it'd be to coach them and how much of a better life we'd have. And you know, it's interesting you, you talk about you know, getting to 50 and maybe it's, maybe it's, it's not because I'm in a midlife crisis, maybe it's because I'm 49, but you know, I think a lot about what do I want to achieve? It probably brought into focus more recently on, on two things. One, obviously, putting myself up there to be a national coach and in a difficult situation, you know, the, the culture and identity had and, and been lost from the team and I was trying to sort of turn it around, but also leave myself exposed. And then more recently, unfortunately, my dad passed away recently. It was a sudden event. It's heartbreaking for the family and heartbreaking for me and my two brothers and sister. And he was 78. And I think a lot about what the legacy he left and the legacy I want to leave as his son, really. But I realize the clock is ticking and I'm not feeling, like, you know, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I don't feel like I'm getting like really old. But what do I want to do? I want to leave a mark on society. I want to make a difference in the world um, in some small way. I want to help people get better. It's getting that balance right as well between, you know, your, my desire to, to lead and be effective as a leader, but also be a great husband, a great father, and a great support for my mum now. You're speaking my language with this about leaving a legacy or leaving a positive mark on society to help others. And it's the soul of this show, actually, is to try and bring the lessons you're bringing to, to life. No, I can see that. I can see that. I think it's great that you're doing it. Here's a question I've been dying to ask you. So if you take sport, people treat sport and business different. And there's a lot of leadership talks from sport to business, and they're quite generic. And this is what I was really attracted to your work is that it's not generic. It's very specific. It's very purposeful. With that in mind, if you're a CEO and you're coming into a business, you haven't picked those people in the roles. People are tired. Some people are stuck like the 50 year old we talked about who doesn't really want to be there, wants the status quo. How do you start? Like, so you're coming into a team, you inherit the team. What are your steps towards building it or rebuilding it? The starting point for me would be to understand the culture, to understand it, looking from the outside in, from asking great questions, from meeting people and finding out where the culture is and how strong their identity is and what's the higher purpose. And the only way you can do that and the only way I would do that would be to meet people and ask good questions and spend time with them and listen, meet people one-on-one, -on -one, build relationships. The point as well where I would outline my vision for the future, I think I would talk about the reason why that I joined the organization and why I felt it could be a special place and why it is a special place. I would talk about the future where, you know, and I would try and paint a vivid picture for the future about where I think the team can go. So you very much described my entrance to Leinster, really, because obviously the team were in place. I didn't know any players. I didn't know any coaches. And Leo introduced me to the playing group. And he said, uh, this is the head, the head coach. And he said, and Stuart's here. And uh, most of the players looked at me as if to say, you're the guy who's coaching England against Ireland half the time. You know, so, and I stood in front of the players and I said, listen, it's a privilege to be here. I genuinely think we can go and win the European Cup. And I said, and the reason I'm saying that is because I look at the quality of the people looking at me now. And I know that if we tidy up one or two things and we work on one or two things, then we could have a team that, that can win the European Cup again. And um, I'm sure half the group were thinking, I don't actually believe that's true, but, uh, but that, that wasn't the point. I wanted to, I wanted them to understand that I believed it. Um, and then over the course of the sort of next six weeks, I had those conversations, learned more about it. And then I went to a second presentation and I said, I want to come back to the point about winning and understand how we're going to do this. And here's the reasons why I think we can. And then I provided five pieces of evidence. I talked about the experience of the group. 
talked about the identity of the team, how there's so many homegrown players. I talked about the uh, cohesion that we had in terms of the longevity of the players playing together. I talked about the way in which we trained. And I talked about our part in the community that ultimately is our higher purpose and how our job as rugby players in Leinster is to inspire the next generation of players, but also to connect to the community. And I said, there's lots of clubs I've been in, but there's not many clubs that have got all those pieces in place like we have here. And that wasn't just me talking off the top of my head. That was me doing my research. It was asking the former players, asking the current players. And that's part of leadership. You know, leadership is creating belief in a team, creating belief in an organization, creating a reason why we're all going to work hard for this organization. It's inspiring people with a vision for the future. It's making performance meaningful. How do you create performance meaningful so that the people who you lead would willingly follow you, even if they're not paid? Do you know what I mean? So they're not just doing it because it's the job. And yeah, absolutely. You, you, you do it because they would willingly follow you as the leader. And that's what leadership is. And people who I've worked with have been great managers. They organize stuff and the strategic plans in place. And you know what we're doing today, tomorrow, and the next week, and the next month. But ultimately, they lack something which means that they're always destined to be managers. And nothing wrong. You need lots of good managers in an organization. But there is a difference between being a manager and a leader. I think it's important people understand that. It's one of the things that I loved about your work is the idea of the why. Why are we doing this? Like you say, most leadership, and I'm doing air quotes here, is actually management in companies. And it's not the person in the leadership position's fault. It's just the old order. That's the old order of the world. You've seen it in the education system. We've been educating people for an industrial age that doesn't exist anymore. And it's one of the reasons I do this show is we're going into this period of uncertainty in the business world. Artificial intelligence is coming. I know there's a lot of people saying that it isn't, it will, and it will look like it will happen overnight, but it's happening gradually. Yeah. And people, and I'm talking about kids coming out of colleges, are uncertain about what careers to take. Hence why stuff like resilience, stuff like emotional intelligence, and those characteristics to build in people are more important than ever before. I think particularly when you talk about young people coming out of colleges and schools, the big thing I noticed is the art of communication. So a lot of the communication that takes place nowadays is through a phone, through an app, or through a photo. My kids are 17 and 18. You know, I can see it firsthand, you know, the way in which technology has changed their life compared to me. I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm really old, but I got my first mobile phone when I was 30. Now, slightly late, you know, I was teaching at the time, but um, a 10-year-old has a mobile phone now, and the things that they can do in a mobile phone is way beyond anything but so everything's done for you to a certain extent you don't have to buy an a to z and learn how to read a map because you just put it on google maps and you follow the instructions and so that's how life is so we've got to find ways to particularly with the new leaders is to create that ability to communicate and i think i I agree with you about artificial intelligence but also think that it's going to come full circle and we're going to end up back with the most effective people in organizations are not the artificial intelligence people it's the people who have the capacity and the ability to read emotion and to create connections between people and i'll be amazed if we can find a robot that can do that that piece you talked about i think when you came to leinster is connecting with the community and business needs to learn this lesson that business has to serve the community and it's been serving the shareholder for much too much time and by serving the community it's the circular economy. You're giving back, but you're also earning while giving back. And that seems to be very much part of the strategy in the teams that you build. Yeah, it always has been. I think one of the key things is for that to be really achieved, it has to be driven from the very, very top of the organization. So it's overall me as the head coach having that mentality, but the board and the decision makers right at the top of the organization have to share that philosophy. And they have to stick to it through good times and bad. And that's where sometimes I think organizations get it wrong, where the next quarter is the only thing that really matters. I've come from a teaching background and an academy background. So I'd be a a type of leader that would be looking to build long-term high-performing team rather than something that's just going to win the short term with no thought or consequence of the long term, uh, consequences of what the long term will be. And that's where I think, you know, people at the top of the organizations really have a huge role to play in shaping that from the top down. Apart from sport, where 
for example, you're given the time to develop a team. So a coach comes in, say, for example, it's a failing team or it's a non-performing team who has the potential and they keep jumping from coach to coach and blaming the coach when the coach needs time to come in and rebuild, not just build a team, but build a club. And building a club means looking at grassroots, it means looking at the next generation, it means looking at the community and putting all those things together. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. If I could describe how I'd set about building a, a long-term high-performing team, you know, with what you've described from grassroots through to the top, imagine a pyramid and the base layer I would start would be the culture of the organization, get the culture right. Then I'd talk about the identity of what it means to work for this team or this organization and the history of it. You know, we create stories about the former players or the former people who used to work here and what the company is striving to achieve. So a real sense of identity, so cultural identity. Then we talk about the higher purpose, which sits way beyond the next quarter or the next tournament that you're playing in as a team. Once you've got that, then you can drive behaviors and standards within the organization. So the values. So for example, at Leinster, we have humble brothers and ruthless. You know, not ruthless, you know, do anything to win, ruthless to hold each other to account. Because ultimately in sport, it is about winning, as I've found to our cost. So culture, identity higher purpose, behaviors and standards, then you get ownership. And then ultimately what you want is player-led leadership. So you want the people in a sporting context to drive the performance. So when we played in the European Cup final, you know, I didn't say much that week at all because the senior players were driving it. They owned the team and the performance. And that's equivalent to being a business. You're the CEO of the business. But actually, the people on the ground are driving it because they understand all those pieces of the jigsaw and they are empowered to do so the accountability. I'd love to finish up on this. So oftentimes when people point the finger, they forget this three pointing back at themselves. So I often hear people complaining about, oh, the company has no vision or the company has no purpose, but you have to have a personal purpose and a personal vision for yourself and start with you and then try and align those with the company if possible. And I know that's not always possible. It may be restricted in your job choices or the company choices that you can join. But Looking at yourself as, let's say, you're a corporate athlete, many people look after just their performance in work, but it goes way beyond that. And I'd love to get your thoughts on looking after the body and the mind, which often feed each other. Look after your body. You have a better performing mind as a result. I'd love to get your thoughts on that, Stuart. Yeah, a couple of things that I've learned along the way. So one, you're right, you know, you've got to lead yourself first before you can lead others. So complete clarity on your on and off field philosophy. So let's talk about a rugby context. So before we talk about the mind and body and health and stuff, you know, I need clarity on what do I believe in, in terms of the values and behaviors that I want to see in the team that I run? What are the technical details of the way I, it's non-negotiables. So I would, I would make sure that that was the case, making sure I understand what do I want to achieve in life? I go back to the point about leaving a mark. I enjoy helping players grow, helping people achieve, helping teams connect. That's what gets me out of bed. And I don't want to finish work when I'm, however old I am, 65, 70 years old, or have a, and, and not feel I've left a mark on society. But in order to do that, you're right. You need to be able to lead yourself first. Now, how do I go about it? Um, I would say I'm reasonably clean living. So I would look after myself. In terms of general health and well-being, I would eat well. I don't drink too much. I enjoy the times when I go out with friends and socialize. It's not like I'm a, I'm a hermit or anything. So I really, you know, I enjoy socializing with family and friends. But um, I'd go to the gym. I'd make sure I looked after myself from a physical point of view, from a mental point of view. When I'm in Leinster, I'm actually living away from my family, so I'm commuting backwards and forwards to Leeds in the UK, and I don't have a TV. I decided not to get a TV. I can always watch stuff on the the Mac if I need a bit of downtime or whatever else, but I'll have the radio on or a podcast on or I won't have anything on. And that gives me that bit of space to think. And I think everyone needs that. And then I guess the third part of the jigsaw is making sure that I'm doing being the best husband and dad I can to my wife and kids. And I know if I get those three things right, if I get my health and fitness and everything else, if I get the space to think and I commit to being a good father and a good husband, then I usually am, I'm on track. I'm on track. It's when one of those drops off for whatever reason, those plates that you're spinning all the time, one of the plates doesn't spin as well, then uh, I 
I'm always quick to go back to it. And it's recognising that, I think. And I think that'd be my advice to anyone who's in a similar sort of age bracket to me, similar position to me, where you're in that CEO thing. You've got to get that balance right. And if you don't, you let the fitness slip or you let the, the family thing slip or you let the piece that you need to, to contemplate your next move, then uh, it's difficult. It's difficult. And we often then go to fix the symptom, not the actual cause, which you learn a lot from playing rugby. Last three questions, and they're all the same question, but targeted at different people. If you had a piece of advice for a young budding athlete listening to the show, what would you tell him or her? Remember the rocky road. The ones who've really gone on to be the super elite are the ones who've gone through the rocky road. So don't allow one setback to to change your mindset about wanting to be the best you can be. And ultimately, that's all you can be, is the best you can be. Sometimes it's out of your control. Sometimes an injury will strike. Sometimes a selector or a coach will make a decision. But you don't want to look back in the mirror and say, I didn't give myself the, the best chance. And then to a parent, similar advice to a parent trying to raise the best character in their child that they can. There's a great book, Finding the Champion in Your Child. And uh, ask good questions. Don't tell all the time. Don't say what you think. Ask them good questions. Ask your kids good questions. How do you feel he played today? He had it okay. What score would you give it out of 10? Your son goes, "Mm, seven. What would make it an eight? Yeah, I probably need to do this, this, and this. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, do you want to work on that together? Yeah, okay, let's let's do that. You know, rather than saying, I thought you were pretty poor today, I think, you know. uh, (laughs) And hear that all the time from parents. Get out uh, of my sight, son. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You've let let the family know. I'm not saying it's easy because it's difficult being a parent. You know, I mean, my kids are say uh, 17 and 18, and uh, I've been in a high profile position. So it's not been easy for them. I've been away from home a lot, but uh, we're getting through the difficult times. Any consolation, but you know, those teenage years, geez, they're, they're a challenge. Do you know, one thing I find very difficult is you mentioned your upbringing. I've had a similar upbringing. I was brought down the country working on similar to a farm, a nursery, a plant nursery, growing plants and stuff. And it's great. It's it's so good. And I know we always project ourselves onto the next generation and think, you know, oh, back in my day, we used to play in bare feet and all this kind of thing. But you want to make them comfortable, but not make it easy for them because exactly. you want them to experience the rocky road to build character and build resilience. Yeah, exactly. One of the difficult things I find about parenting is actually letting go as well, particularly as they've passed the driving test and now they're on their own. And, and sometimes you're desperate to say, this is going to end in tears, but actually you've got to let it end in tears sometimes. Not obviously, you know, Nothing dramatic, but there's, there's an element of they have to fail to succeed and you have to let them go through that process. And then finally, so for the main listener of this show, C-suite executive, CEO, what's your advice to them as a leader and a builder of teams? Understand that leaders are born, but also they're made as well. And you can, be get, you can get better. Um, you can always get better to be a better leader by studying the art of leadership, by raising your self-awareness by getting feedback on your own performance by be open-minded and having a mindset to learn and, and improve get a mentor you don't just pass a course and you become a leader create time for reflection and enjoy it because the more leaders we have in this world the better the world will be fantastic way to finish leader builder of teams and coach of leinster and many teams to come Stuart lancaster thanks for joining us no problem thank you